Hello everyone and welcome to Autism Stories, where we connect you with amazing people that help teens and adults with autism become more independent and successful. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Storytelling is something that is universally loved as a way to educate and entertain in every culture. I think you can look no further in our culture with the growth of companies like Netflix, Hulu, and HBO, to name just a few, to confirm this fact. However, how many times are you hearing the voice of autistic people in in these stories? Today we will talk with Becca Laurie about how Geek Club Books gives people with autism an opportunity to share their important voices and essential stories. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Becca, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, I've met so many adults uh, that were diagnosed with autism as adults. How did that uh, process evolve for you? my life um, trying to just figure out what was different about me, why I was having such a hard time. And I was a single child and a mom, single mom, so it was just she and I just trying to figure out everything. And then at about the age of 33, I kind of went into a huge depression after I lost my 13th job in 15 years. And I kind of gave up. I just put myself in bed in the house I grew up in and said, I'm done. I couldn't figure out kind of what was that made me different or what it was that was making the world difficult for me, um, so I just gave up. That's kind of how it was. And then uh, about three years into being in that situation, I was looking at the other medical concerns that I had, and I kind of went into the, like, Wikipedia vortex you go into when you click at the bottom of all the articles, uh, and somewhere in that journey, I found sensory processing disorder, which felt really, really familiar to me. Um, and was super common for me, and I, I understood all of it. And then at the bottom of that, there was a link to Asperger's syndrome, and I'd never heard of it. And I just started to read uh, the int- the entry, and as I was reading it, I felt like I was reading my own biography. Um, so when I was finished, I sort of sent it along to my mom, asked her for her opinion, and that's kind of how we went about on our journey to do the diagnosis. Now, currently you're working with uh, Geek Club Books. How did that relationship come about, and what are you doing with them? Uh, well, when I was, I had been doing uh, autism nonprofit for quite some years, and then I sort of decided I wanted to go out on my own, that I had things I wanted to say that I didn't um, want to risk attaching to an organization. So uh, I went off on my own to become a consultant, and I was really looking for um, a home for my writing, a place, uh, another alternative source that I could put out what it was that I had to say. Uh, so I approached Cody, uh, who runs Geek Club Books, and I asked uh, if she was interested in having someone else blog, if it was something I thought they could do with her. And she was excited. She said, sure. And so we kind of worked from there. Uh, and so I started out blogging. And then um, as I worked with Jody, uh, other opportunities came up that I could represent geek called books for her uh, at Comic-Cons and things like that. Um, so it's sort of been helping spread the word. Um, and, then, and then as we grew, as geek called books grew, we took on Zoom off as a magazine as a partner. Uh, and so we've been working on that. And now my writing goes in there. So that's sort of what I've been doing. It's really fun for me to work with Jody. She really supports autistics and our creation and just our voice in general. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to work with somebody who supports me that way. Now, how can uh, listeners learn more about Geek Club Books and read your wonderful writing? Um, If you head over to the Geek Club Books website, so that's geekclubbooks.com, if you head over there, there's a bunch of different blogs on the website. One of them is mine, so you can read mine there. But there's uh, other blogs by other autistic authors as well. Um, and then Jody does a really great thing where she created a lot of resources using comic books and animation and things like that uh, for schools and for parents uh, and for younger kids. And so there's some of that stuff there, the resources that you can download and share, um, and you can pass along the message of equal books. Now, you're a columnist for each issue of Zoom magazine um, and have written many wonderful articles. One article you wrote that I particularly enjoyed was titled Live Your Dreams Autistically. You talked about at one point being miserable because you followed the dreams of others 
had for you instead of following your own dreams. How did you go about turning that around and living a life of your dreams? Well, it really started with my diagnosis. I really didn't understand myself very well. Um, so I spent sort of the first year after my diagnosis, weekly therapy, really just getting to know myself, getting to know what it meant for me to be autistic, how that might change my life, or well, not change my life, and I'm just kind of getting to know myself and my needs. Um, and what I realized in doing that process was that I've been ignoring my own needs and wants for a very long time. That I was living in a world where what I naturally wanted to do, be, and say um, was usually kind of dismissed or I was told to change it or be different about it. And so I had learned to kind of ignore my own, my own needs. And uh, that was a really good habit to get into because what it meant was I was a really uncomfortable, unhappy person. Moving, you know, to do all the supposed to that I had been told to. Like, get married, have a good job, buy a house, have kids, all of that. None of what really is not to me and wasn't really what I was looking for out of life. But I thought I was wrong to want something different. Um, and so I kind of had spent a good portion of my life doing that. So after I had gotten to know myself a little better, I started to really question a lot of the choices that were I was making in my life and if I was making them for myself or if I was making them for other people. And that was a really interesting process for me and it set me on a journey to, to sort of really push myself to create a life that I didn't even vacation from, to create uh, a way of living that didn't feel like it was so exhausting to me that I needed days off from my life. And that's what I did. You know, I had always wanted not to be a city person. I had always wanted a lot of space and nature around me. I knew I had never wanted kids, things like that, that people had always sort of told me I was wrong about. How could you not want to live in a city? How could you not want kids? You'll change your mind, all of those kind of things. But that stuff didn't change for me. And now I'm living in my dream house in the middle of the mountains in Colorado with neighbors far away and a bunch of my pack uh, living with me because that's what I chose to be with. And I'm much happier for it. That's great. Now, another wonderful article you wrote that really resonated with me is because there are many people with autism that have a great support network, but there's many others that do not, and that often uh, can start with with family. So okay. that and that can really that type of dynamic can really cause all kinds of anxiety and depression. So So when you received your autism diagnosis, this changed for you and you decided to redefine the people and animals that you chose to surround yourself with. Why did you decide to make this choice then? Um, Well, kind of growing up, I was a little too much for a lot of my family. My mom and I kind of dealt with a lot of issues where we were being left out of things or not able to do things the way other people were doing them and stuff like that. And so, you know, my experience in real life of family versus what the definition of family is versus what TV tells us family is, they didn't make sense together and, and it never worked. So I had sort of learned in my head that there were some words that, you know, people used to mean something, and that wasn't my experience of those words. And I started to really struggle with those words, the words like friends, family, uh, things like that, um, because I had not had such great experiences. And I realized as an adult, it was really entirely up to me who I wanted to share my space with, share my time with, share my feelings with and my my personal struggles with, um, and that was entirely up to me, and that didn't mean that those people had to be related to me. And so what I found was that the people that were most supportive of me and the people I felt most comfortable with and the people that I wanted to spend time with were not my family of blood, but were my family of choice. Um, and so I decided that I would kind of redefine that word for myself so that I could build a family that I felt was acting like what I think the word family is supposed to mean. And so what I did was I surrounded myself with those people, a lot of people that I met through the autism community. And then, of course, my whole life, I had always had pets. I'd always loved animals. I'd always been um, surrounded by that particular kind of love, and it's something that, 
you know, I always wanted a lot of animals, and people would say, oh, well, you shouldn't have too many, you only need one cat, or, you know, I make judgments about, um, but that didn't feel right to me, it, it sort of, you know, I always wanted more, and so now I have a much larger pack, dogs, cats, and, and others, and that is part of my family, it's part of my support system, those guys are my, my support system through the challenges, even though um, most people would not consider them family. <laughs> Now, I'd, I'd recommend just about any article you've written in Zoo Magazine. However, the last article I wanted to talk with you about was um, talking about your pre-charge day ideas. First, um, can you share with everyone what is a pre-charge day and what are the types of stressful things that you feel you need a pre-charge day for? with the concept of a pre-charge is that um, in the consulting, as I started to grow as a consultant, there started to be more travel. And I am not a travel person. I am. I like home. I like home a lot. Um, I like my pajamas. And I, I really don't like not being in control of the whole situation. And that's what travel kind of does for me. It sort of throws me off my routine. Nothing's familiar. I'm not in control of how it's all going to go. And it's kind of a really uncomfortable scenario for me. And it's exhausting. It also is a lot of spoons, right? It's a lot of energy to physically pack and physically get to all of the travel components and get it all done. And that's exhausting for me in terms of sensory and also social. And so there's all these layers of exhaustion that come with travel. And so I needed to figure out a way that if I wanted to keep doing some of this travel, a way to make it more sustainable, something that I could do for a long period of time, not mm-hmm. something that would be short-winded and then I'd have to recover from from Okay, so what I started to do is I realized that if I started to do more pre-planning, like packing a little bit earlier um, and thinking about kind of directions and all of those things and getting all of my travel organized a little bit earlier, if I could do that, I could kind of get that done. And then the day before that I really need to be moving and traveling, I could kind of take a a recharge before I need it. So that's when I started to call it a pre-charge. So it was like, okay, well, can I use up all my energy that I need to pack and get ready for this trip? And then can I recharge back up before I have to get going on the travel? Mm-hmm. Right? And so I started to schedule those days into my calendar. So when I was working, I wouldn't make any appointments for that day. I wouldn't do any chores on that day. I would really just block it off as the day to sit around in my pajamas and just nap or whatever and just be low-key. And what I found when I did that was that I wasn't as exhausted when I got to my destination, which means that I wasn't quite as exhausted by the time I got home either, which made the recovery period a little bit shorter. So I started to schedule the day after recoveries too, and I kind of had, if it was a for two days, I'd be off for four days, because that's what I needed to do for me. Um, but what happens with that, you know, over time is that you, you say, well, are there other places in my life where I could use this concept of pre-charging? Right? Can I, right. are there, there are ways that I can, can use it other places? So I know some, for some people, they struggle, um, like the Sunday before going to work on Monday. So doing something like Sunday morning, setting out your clothes for work and kind of getting yourself organized and doing your to-do list for Monday and then turning off for the rest of Sunday. Like, no worries, I can wake up tomorrow morning and get all set. And that kind of stuff. So, that's what I started to do with it. And I am finding that the more I sort of anticipate environments or experiences that are going to be exhausting, if I can kind of charge up beforehand, it helps me to get through the entire thing. And so that's really where it came from. Mm. Now, you are the first guest on our podcast who hosts her own podcast, uh, Spectrumly Speaking. So and that's a podcast for and by women on the autism spectrum. What have you learned from this experience? So we did it for about two years, and it's been an interesting medium for me, right? It was, it's sort of like an odd mix, because you're not, you don't have any visuals, right? You don't have... Right. <laughs> you don't have to worry about your facial expressions and all of that stuff. Um, but at the same time, your voice needs to be sort of animated, so it's like an animated phone call. It's like a little bit more than that, you know? And finding my podcast voice, finding that comfort zone uh, in that place, it's been really fun, because it's 
because I'm not worrying about facial expressions or what I'm wearing or what my hair looks like or any of those things, it really allows me, I think, to speak more freely and to really think about things as I'm I'm talking about them and really get into good discussions because it eliminates some of the things that I have to otherwise with energy, like eye contact or to my body, how my body language is or, you know, what I'm looking at or what I look like or any of those things. So that was a really fun part of it. But I think, you know, it, it serves a purpose because the reason for doing it was, hey, you know, not only are there women on the spectrum out here, but there's a huge contingent of women who support the women of the spectrum or people on the spectrum, women professionals and researchers that were not really getting highlighted either. Um, and so it was a good way to sort of spin the focus on that and remind people that as autistics, we can also get along with neurotypicals and that there are some neurotypicals that are actually our allies. And so um, it was a really great way to be doing that in a, a, you know, a tangible way. And I like playing with different mediums, so I, I took the opportunity as soon as it came my way. Right. And uh, do you have any tips for me? Because right now I'm about six months or so into into this podcast. So do you have any tips about how I can, because um, I'm always trying to explore um, finding my voice as, as the interviewer. I think the thing that I found was most helpful was um, remembering to have fun with it. Right, so you know, I wanted to make sure that real information was coming out, and I wanted to make sure that fact was coming out. And I think in the beginning, I took that so seriously that I took myself so seriously, um, and I stopped having fun with it. And I think what people, why people listen to a podcast is because they want to be entertained while being given the information. And so I had to remember that if people were listening, they also kind of wanted to listen to me in some weird way, and so to make sure that I was being authentically myself. Right. I think that's some great advice. Uh, well, I really appreciate your time today. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to today's episode, and thank you so much to Becca for the conversation. I really liked the idea Becca presented in terms of the pre-charge day as a way to decrease anxiety and to increase the likelihood of success in stressful situations. So often, teens and adults with autism struggle with anxiety and, as a result, don't have success in their lives. Autism Personal Coach is a unique service in that we help those with autism by working on meaningful, individualized goals in in a setting which they'll be used. So their anxiety is greatly reduced and, and as a result, can be more independent and successful. To get an autism coach for a loved one or yourself, it's very easy. All you have to do is email autismpersonalcoach at yahoo.com or call 216-336-5889 and request a coach today. On next week's episode of Autism Stories, we will talk with Nathan Morgan of Milestones Autism Resources about those with autism who are also part of the LGBT community. Talk to you then. Conversation is Even with practice, we still struggle to having a relationship with someone we like, talking to people. Just